We are going to go into the book of Mark today. The book of Mark. Uh, this is the um, Jesus heading on the road to um, his death. Jerusalem for the last time. This is um, the last healing in the book of Mark. This is something that uh, Mark feels is important that we notice. So let's stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. And we're going to go on to Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Let's see if this works. There you go. They came to Jericho as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd. Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the road when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many warned him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, have mercy on me, son of David. Oops. Where are we? There we are. My slides got off. There we are. Uh, Jesus stepped, stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man and he said to him, have courage. Get up. He is calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered him, what do you want me to do for you? Rabboni, the blind man said to him, I want to see and Jesus said to him, go, your faith has saved you. Immediately he could see and began to follow Jesus on the road. Yeah. Father God, we praise you today, Lord. We pray that we can see. We can see your scriptures today as it applies to the world around us, to ourselves individually. We pray that your Holy Spirit be felt. Lord, I pray that if any distractions be on us right now, that, that they be rid from us for just a little bit. If we could just be focused solely on you. Lord, I pray that, uh, that your voice be heard today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this passage takes place in the book of, in the, in the place of Jericho. Let me see if I can bring, do this right here. Is that one. Jericho's right there. There we go. Right there. That's Jericho. Now, Jericho is one of those cities that you might have heard about. If you've read your Bible, and probably even if you didn't read your Bible, you knew that song, Jericho, and those walls, they came tumbling down. You probably know about Jericho. Jericho is one of the oldest cities in the world. It's mentioned 59 times in the Bible. It's one of them places that keep coming up. It was a trade center in the life of Jesus, in the time of Jesus. It was the city in which the Israelites first entered into the land of the promise. And now it's the start of the final leg of Jesus' ministry. Now, see, in Jesus' time, the Jews would pilgrim from all over, but especially from like Galilee, which is up here, and they would travel to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is down here. Now, Jesus would be in a time period where they had this group of people called the Samaritans. They lived in this area over here. Now, the Samaritans... We're like, you know, that, that stepbrother you wish you never had. They're the one, that person in the family you don't talk about. The Samaritans were people, they were, they were, they were half Jew and half something else. 
and they had their own religious practices, but they did follow the Torah. But they have the, the what's called the Samaritan Torah, which is a Samaritan Pentateuch, which is slightly different than the Jews Pentateuch. And so they had they had different. So they, they were the, the group of people that were just different, and we don't talk about them. We don't like them. We don't. They avoided them. They avoided them to the point that if you're traveling from Galilee, you couldn't just go down like this to Jerusalem. You had to go around. Back through Jericho into Jerusalem. Into Jerusalem. So you would go through um, Jericho. Now Jericho is one of those trade centers because all the roads led to Jericho. <laughs> Went through Jericho. It was a fort city in the ancient times for a reason because it, the trade routes went through there and it could protect the land. And so these people. Uh, so Jer- so Jesus is heading up through. Uh, Jericho, heading to Jericho, down to Jerusalem for this last bit of his ministry. Now, in Jericho, like any other big city you see, even small cities, there were beggars. Now, but Jericho had a large beggar population. They would line up on the outside of the city and wait on the hospitality of people traveling fr- through Jericho into Jerusalem, down to the holy city. Especially during times of uh, pilgrimage, when you had like your holy uh, festivals that everyone was supposed to travel down to Jerusalem for. Which Jesus does come during these holy cities. We've seen many festivals that Jesus takes part in. As Jesus comes towards the end of his life, he's heading down there for Passover. But he's going to head down there through, and so they would be on the walls waiting for handouts. Now, he's a blind man. In ancient days, you know, they didn't have Braille. They didn't have seeing eye dogs. They didn't have assisted living. If you were blind, you were totally dependent on the charity of others for your daily needs. For your protection, for your food. And this man apparently doesn't have anyone else beside him. And these people which every society has them, often become society's expendables. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. We even have those today, right? We have these people that we consider expendable. These are people that if the world were, you know, if they were to disappear, no one would miss them. Well, some of you feel that way too. You think you're one of them. Of course, wasn't that that movie, It's a Wonderful Life? That many of you watched over Christmas, don't lie. That's what that's about. He felt expendable. Of course, the whole movie is about he's not, but. And we have those people and those kind of people in our, in our and, you know, there's down on the corners or homeless or. I heard that. And the society around them treats, the crowd that's around Jesus treats this man like he's expendable. When he starts crying out, son of David, son of David, he hears, hey, you know, he can't see him, obviously. So, hey, that's Jesus of Nazareth? That's the son of David. Son of David, son of David, son of David, I need your attention. And they're like, shut up, man. I mean, they chide him for being, uh, causing trouble. They, they the, you know why? They don't want to see him. I love the imagery here. He's a blind man who cannot see, and they're trying to be blind to the blind man. That's irony right there. The society trying to be blind to the blind man. And, you know, I think about, as I read this, I think, how often do we do that, right? Right? We close our eyes to the people around us. 
Now, realistically speaking, you cannot help everybody. That's just realistic. Speaking. Jesus didn't even help everybody. You think everyone on that wall was helped by Jesus? It only has record of Jesus helping one. There are people that come to Jesus all the time, and he does not help them. Jesus helps this one, though. I think that's sometimes our problem is we have, uh, I can't help everyone, so I help no one attitude. And that's, that's, that's I mean, really one of the things we get caught up in is, you know, because you, you, if you help one person, well, then I can help the next person, and then I, so I better not help anybody. But that's not what the, the, the Bible teaches us, is that we are supposed to be hospital. We're supposed to care for those, those that are less fortunate. Those are, we can help. And unfortunately, we can't help everybody. But maybe I can help the one. And that may help, that help may look like um, giving food, but it, in other, a lot of times it's, it's something bigger. Jesus is, is looking for something bigger than just food. I mean, yes, food is important. No one's going to tell you it's not. But Jesus is looking bigger. He always looks bigger. And so when this man cries out, he says, Son of David, they chide him. And they don't bring him to, like in other cities, we have record of like the people that need healing and they like, bring him to him. Like, remember that guy? Like, they even cut a hole in the roof to lower his friend down. No one's doing that for this guy. <laughs> There's no one bringing him to him. Now, Mark gives us this man's name, which is, is important. I think that's important. Because a lot of the other people that Jesus heals, we don't get their name. They're like the leper or the blind man. or the, We don't get their names. So that means Mark has called this guy out for a reason. Now, this man's name, Timaeus, uh, it means worthy of honor. So here we have this man who is, his name means worthy of honor, being treated without honor. Mark's playing on this. And here, this man worthy of honor is giving honor to someone else. That is Jesus Christ. Mark sees this as important. Because the man who is worthy of himself honor is giving honor to Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus calls to him. And I, I think that's important too. He says, call him to me. The man's calling out, and he says, call him to me. He doesn't say, hey, go get him. He doesn't say, you know, uh, hey, man, over here. He doesn't go to him. He says, you're calling me, I call to you. I think this is important. Jesus calls us. He calls us. He called his disciples. He called them by name. He calls this man, call him to me. I think it's important because I think sometimes we, we forget that people need to hear the calling of Jesus Christ. We think, well, they've heard it on the TV. They heard it on the radio. And we forget that we need to be calling people to Christ. And Jesus says, call him to me. And so Jesus says, call him. And so the man comes, he gets up, throws up his robe, come to him and and he says, what do you want for me to do? Now, for us, that seems like kind of a dumb question, doesn't it? But this is a question that forces him to say, what can this man do for me? I mean, he's, 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 he's available for an option right here. Well, he can give me some money. We know that Jesus probably has some money on him. He could give him some money. He could give me some food. That's, that's immediately what I need, Right? But Jesus said, what do you want me to do for that? And this man has to say, well, do I have the faith? Do I have the faith to ask what I really want? What I really need? And, of course, the man has to look beyond his immediate needs, which is something for us that's hard to do. It's hard for him to do. It's hard for all of us to do. We have to look past our immediate needs, right? Our immediate needs, yeah, I need a little more cash. I need COVID to go away. I need a different group of politicians. I need, it's hard for us to look past the immediate needs. 
And Jesus is saying, I need you to look at yourself. What do you want of me? And so instead of asking for a job or for money or for, uh, you know, a place on the wall that he could get better food, you know, he says, Jesus, I need to see. And that means I have the faith. I believe in you, Jesus, enough that I can ask that you will make me see. Because anyone could hand him money. I need, I got, the, I got a faith. I, Jesus, I need you to make me see. And so the statement of faith, there's, the, Jesus says, the statement of faith heals you. You can see. Now, he doesn't pull out his magic wand. He doesn't spit, like other times he spat in the mud and mixed it together, rubbed it, he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't spell it, say any magic spells. No choirs from heaven on this one. He just says, with your faith, you're saved. And I like how he says it there, you're saved. And along with his salvation came sight. It wasn't, hey, you're see, let me tell you about salvation. It was your saved, and along with his salvation came his sight. The man of faith can see. Isaiah, let me see if I can bring this up. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16 says, I will lead the blind by the way they did not know. I will guide them on the path they have not known. I will turn darkness into light in front of them and rough places into level ground. This is what I will do for them, and I will not abandon them. This is God speaking to all of us. God seeking to heal the blind. More than just pointing out blindness. Hey, dude, do you know you're blind? But in truth, aren't we all blind at some times in our life? At some time in your life, you all were blind. Some of you are still blind. For lack of better terms, we call it spiritual blindness. I don't really like that term, but it's what we have. These people, spiritual blindness is the, the, when you, you can't see that the choices you are making are leading you down the path of destruction. Now, in Israel, in Jesus' time, he has spent his whole ministry telling them, you can't see, but if you listen to me, the path you are walking will lead to your destruction. you got to turn from that and follow me. Now, that means spiritually, but also physically. You know, the Israelites are, will be destroyed in AD 70 because they don't follow God. They don't follow through with Jesus. They, they will be destroyed when the Romans destroy them in 87, burn the temple down. And Jesus is pointing that out. But he's pointing out spiritually, you know what? You've got to follow me. You can't see that the choices you make are leading you to hell. How many of us can see that? I mean, that speaks to us as a nation as churches, as people, individuals, we must be able to see whether or not the path we walk is illuminated by God or leading us down the path of darkness into destruction. And some people are blind. I'm willing to bet that there are people in this room right now, someone in this room right now, who has not accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. They have not believed. They are still blind. The evidence is out there. They've laid out. The, see, the thing about that is if once you're with sight, you say, well, how can you not know? I had that conversation this morning with someone. You look and say, well, how do they not see? 
Because I got sight. But they're blind. The evidence is there. Which through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus reaches out his hand and says, trust me. I want to lead you to a place of sight. And those who continue to choose to be blind say, no, God, I don't want to trust you. I don't believe in you. So this, 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 this very passage makes us ask ourselves, do I believe? Have I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Because at one point, we were, all were blind. What's that song say? Amazing grace. You know, I once was blind, but now I see. Because I have sight. Because Jesus Christ came into my life. I once was lost, but now I'm found. And Jesus says, is asking question, what do you believe that Jesus is capable of? Is he capable of salvation? Is he capable? Do I need salvation? Is the words that he said true enough that I realize I need salvation? Because that's where a lot of it begins is we don't think we need salvation, so why should we believe? If you don't know you're blind... I heard someone say this morning on a podcast, you know, who discovered water it wasn't a goldfish. Because <laughs> they were surrounded by it. If you don't know you're blind, then how can you know? And that's where Jesus said, call him to me. Call him to me. And as the calling, we know that we can only hear. He says, oh, you need to hear the, by the hearing of the word of God. People come to believe. That's what the Bible tells us. But on top of that, not just belief, spiritual blindness comes to those who believe as well. Jesus says, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Spirit, Savior, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. He says, you are his temple. So you have the Spirit living in you, and you can still be blind to the gifts he's giving you, your spiritual gifts. I've met too many Christians that are blind to what their spiritual gifts are. You may be one of them. Part of the reason for that is because we don't explore the options. What are We just want it to fall in our lap. Well, God, you tell me what my spiritual gift is. He said, I already did. He said, well, I don't see it. Because we choose to be blind. He said, well, I need to know. Well, start with reading your scriptures. Romans chapter 12, that's a great place to stop. Where is your spiritual gifts? Romans chapter 12 talks about spiritual gifts. I, I, it's, uh, there are seven lifted, listed in that area. And it's, uh, it talks about the... Um, uh, and I, I like to refer to those as your seven primaries. Those are the way that all the other spiritual gifts kind of feed off of these seven. And so if you don't know, but the problem is a lot of times if we want to see, we have to actually say, hey, Jesus, give me sight. We have to believe enough. And a lot of us, we're, we're like, I don't want to do that kind of work. I'm good sitting on my pew. I'm perfect right here where I am. This is my sight. This is my sight. As far as all I need to see is what is in front of this pew. We don't desire. Someone say, well, I don't know how. Well, it's because you lack the desire to be trained. The Bible is there. People are there to help you. But we don't ask for help. We just say, well, I don't know. I don't get it. I hate that. I was a school teacher for, year, for, for several years. And what they say, well, I don't get it. You don't get What? What is it? Gary could testify. But we as Christians do the same thing. I don't get it. What are you not getting? Well, what spiritual gift? Well, let's read what a spiritual gift is. Which one am I? Well, we have to explore who are you and what God is doing in you through you. And then we're afraid to try it out because, you know, sometimes we're afraid to try it out because we're afraid we'll be stuck there for the rest of our lives, right? 
Because we as church members, tend, churches tend to do that, right? Well, you've got a body in that position, so you, that's you for the rest of your life. But that's not the way churches are supposed to work. You have a gift to be used for the edification of the people of God. Why not use it for them? But reality is only about, what's the old, the old adage? I don't know if it's true today or not, but it sounds true because it's probably gotten worse. 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. It's because 90% of the people don't want to know what their spiritual gifts is, and if they do want to know, they don't want to do the work to use it. We don't like to work. We choose to close our eyes like the men in the town who were saying, I don't want to hear this blind man. And Jesus says, I don't want to hear you. We say, Jesus, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to hear what's going on. And we have to pray to have faith. To, to with sight. We have to pray with faith. It doesn't always come easy. And of course, every time we see, it forces us to change. And that's one of those words that scares us more than any other word. But I don't like change. And the older you get, the harder it is. And Jesus says, he says, I'll give them light to their path. He says, I'm going to give you a level ground to walk on. You see the other way he did say, I'm going to give you level ground to lay down on. So I'm going to give you level ground to walk on. I'm going to make your path straight. You know what paths are used for? Not for sleeping. Paths are made for walking. Just like boots, right? And so Jesus says, I'm going to give you these paths, but you've got to do, you've got to move. And Bartholomew doesn't simply say, I want to be, you know, I don't want to meet the famous prophet from Nazareth. I don't want food. I don't, you know, I want sight. I want what's best. I want what only God can do for me. He says, I believe. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do I believe? What do I believe that Jesus is capable of doing in my life? A lot of times we say, well, I, I believe he's capable of giving me my next meal, which is absolutely true. He is capable of giving you your next meal. But isn't that putting God on the short stand? Isn't he capable of so much more in your life? Has God given me the gift? Put it into action? God says, I'm going to illuminate. And sometimes we want God to illuminate like the entire way, right? I want to see all the way from here to heaven and exactly what steps I'm supposed to take and which ones I'm not. God never promises that. Go read your Bible. He doesn't promise that. He promised I'm going to light your path up, which means sometimes the only thing you get to see is your next step. I need you to do this next. Only thing you may get to see is is I need you to take that step. Whether it be a step of faith, walk out on the ledge, whether it be a step forward, maybe a step say, I don't, I'm going to give this up. Maybe a step, I'm going to, I believe that I have this gift, I'm going to try it out. We have to take that step because God illuminates that step. And so every week when we ask what's our step, next step, it's not saying, oh, it's time to put up our Bibles. It's the time when we have this conversation with God to say, what path are you illuminating for me today, this week, in this next step? And some steps he illuminates further out. It'll take you months, years to follow. And some steps it'll take you just today. You can get it done today. We must ask yourself, what's my next step? What is God opening my eyes to see? Are we choosing to close our eyes? 
are a part of the mission that God has put on us. Not the mission that, that God's put on me. I know what my mission is. I'm here as pastor of the church, which means I'm here to, to lead you, guide you, and direct you, send you out. Get you guys ready. Now, I don't know if I'm always doing the best job, but I'm doing the best I can, right? That's my job. That's my mission. That's why I'm here. And what's your mission? Your mission isn't to stay at church. That's my job. I'm stay at church. Your job is to go be the church at your homes, in your neighborhoods, at work, in the gym, at the grocery store, in that parking lot. As you drive, yes, people pay attention to that. Ah, some of you guys are guilty. I can hear it. As you drive, tell people about Christ. Because the church will never be relevant enough that we can overcome the call of this world. You know, we can't be showier than the Super Bowl. I don't care what church you are. We ain't got that kind of money. You could be the most dynamic preacher. We have the most dynamic worship music with the, the flashiest light show. You will never be more relevant than the call of the world. It's not about being relevant. It's about being God-filled and gospel above all. If we want to see people come to church, you want to see young folks come to church, it isn't about being relevant. It's about gospel above all. Calling others to Jesus Christ, like Jesus called this man, Bartimaeus, worthy of honor. Come here. And so we got to call others to Christ with the gifts that he's given us. The question is, will we do it? Father God, I praise you today, Lord. Lord, I ask that you bless us, that you illuminate the next step. <coughs> Lord, that you show us what our Holy Spirit gives us, that you open our eyes to see what you are doing around us. Lord, that we, as we see what you are doing around us, that we go and join you in your mission and say, we're going to do what you've called us to do. Lord, I pray that we not be blind, that we choose not to be blind, that we follow after you, that we pray unto you, that we worship you, that we study your scriptures, because we don't want to be blind. We want to be with our eyes open, following you in faith. Walking the path that you illuminate for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now is the time we're going to actually enter into... Uh, a time of invitation. Come to the altar and pray. We invite you to come down and be prayed over. We invite you to say, I want to be a member of the church. We invite you to be baptized. Pastor Tristan's in the back. <laughs>